Ni ama bo. So I only have like five minutes to teach this before my kids come in. So I cannot wear a math ninja hair costume. So I'm, this is gonna be really quick now. So you have a question about proving the product of two um, uh, the functions, the product of limits. So the product of two functions, if each function converges to a limit, the limit goes to the product is also the product of limits. So the proof of that is very easy. This is the S, well not easy, but it's tricky a little bit. And this is the essence of how the product of two continuous functions is still continuous. But this is just like a single instant, a single point. Continuity also has existence of point. It's very easy. Same idea, same proof. So let's do that. So, we know that the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l, and limit of g of x as x approaches a equals k, right? So what does this mean? This means when, let's see if we get it, yeah. This means when x minus a is less than some delta, let's call delta 1, implies f of x minus, not f of a, because we don't know what f of a exists, and, but that's a requirement for continuity. That's the big difference when you do the proof. Is when it's an f, it's less than epsilon, right? And then, whenever x minus a is less than delta 2, some delta 2, when it's within some uh, delta wall, it implies that g of x minus k is less than, well, this epsilon 1, this is less than epsilon 2. Oh, as long as that does not matter. So we know that, right? Uh, let's get that in. Okay, so what can we do? Okay. So I want to show that whenever x minus a is less than some delta, some, some value, this has to force that this guy, f of x minus g of x, or f of x g of x, I want to have this, I want to show that this guy minus lk is less than some epsilon, or any epsilon whenever Whenever uh, my x minus a is less than some delta for some delta, and delta can be a function of x one. It can also be a function of x. Okay, so let's do this. All right, first trick that you may not have done when. First trick you may not have done, but here is a nice trick. Did you know f of x, g of x? So what you can do is add zero, right? So you know plus zero minus lk, right? Or lk. This guy is equal to just add zero man. F of x, g of x minus f of x. G of f of x L plus f of x L minus LK. Okay, that's the first thing you do. But you know that this guy, you group them, right? This guy's equal to f of x, uh, yeah, minus L times G of x. Actually, no, call it f of x. f of x times g of x minus l plus l times f of x minus k. But what can you apply here? Well, yeah, first you have an addition. So you can apply less than equal to, you can apply triangle involving. This guy's less than equal to f of x times g of x minus l absolute value plus l absolute value of f of x minus k of l. Actually, why I put l here? I'm sorry. It's in parentheses. Minus k. Right? So now, let's go. I want to keep these. So, what can we apply here? 
We have our products inside each parentheses, so it can plot out each one Cauchy Swartz inequality. Cauchy Swartz, let's break this guy, says that absolute value of f of x, you see that? Yeah. Absolute value of f of x times absolute value of g of x minus L plus, now this guy's less than equal to this value, plus L, absolute value of L, and absolute value of f of x minus k. So, okay. So here's the thing. It's because you know that I can always I can always find a delta such that f of x minus l is less than epsilon 1. Okay, for any epsilon 1 and any epsilon 2, I can always find some delta. Okay. I choose a delta. So such that whenever I choose a delta, it would be delta one and a half. Such that this guy implies that this guy. Or let, let's do the other one first. I want f of x minus. Ooh. I mix them up. I'm sorry. This guy should be g of x minus. And this guy should be f of x minus k. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. And that's by the limits of definition. I don't know if I got that in the beginning, but it's okay. Yeah. Same trick you can do, just reorganization. Okay, no worry. So, um, next thing to do is, you know g of x minus l is less than epsilon you want to do that suggested. So you choose delta 1 half, it's just that g of x minus l is less than, well, let's keep this one first. Let's look at delta 2 half. It implies f of x minus k is less than, I can choose any fixed epsilon, any epsilon 2. So I choose absolute value of l times, or actually epsilon 2. So I'm going to Q times absolute value, or over absolute value of L as well. Okay. So, first let's choose X minus A less than. So, okay. So right now, we're in the pool. So right now, we're in the pool of absolute value of X minus A less than delta 2 for f. Okay. And this guarantee that this guy's less than equal to f of x or g of x minus l plus absolute value of l over, so this guy, we chose this guy, be less than equal to less than epsilon over 2. Oh wow, it's not less than equal, not less than, because the less than equal, less than there. So plus absolute, so plus absolute value of l over epsilon, over 2, over epsilon value of f. Good so far? Okay. So this guy is equal to f of x times absolute value of g of x minus f plus epsilon over 2. Okay. So I want to turn this guy into epsilon over 2 now. So this is the part you could have been stuck on. So we have Notice that this f of x is within, and this is within, I mean, this is g, f of x, yeah, is now within a ball, because we already restricted, of epsilon around k, of epsilon over 2 over absolute value of l. So we have already forced it to be, to have a maximum. It's already valued. The maximum value of f of x is bounded within this ball. So the idea here is, there's something in, uh, in calculus that you probably learned called the maximum value theorem. If you're on a complex set, the function, the continuous function will achieve a maximum value. That's because of this property of limits. That you're always going to be within, at the value, it's always going to be within some ball, some 
all 